Good evening, everyone. My name is Greg Natterer. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science here at Memorial University. I'd like to begin by giving an acknowledgement that we acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from which you are located and the Indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. We also have a few other um, special days here. Today is Pink Shirt Day. Some of you may be aware um, that it is an anti-bullying campaign campaign that began in 2007 after a male student was bullied for wearing a pink shirt to school. So we remember um, remember this as an anti-bullying day and also that we are in uh, the Black History Month um, from February 1st to March 1st and this month honors the contributions, legacy and accomplishments of Black Canadians to every area of our history. This Speaking of Engineering lecture series promotes engineering in our province and raises awareness of engineering related issues among students, the academic community and the general public, which we feel is very important. I'd like to extend special greetings this evening to our presenters. We have four this evening. Dr. Ting Zhu, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Memorial University. Dr. Oscar De Silva, also an assistant professor in the same department. Dr. Andrew Vardy, professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and cross-appointed to the Department of Computer Science. And Dr. Mohammed El Janade, an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. This lecture series is sponsored by the professional engineers and geoscientists of Newfoundland and Labrador, also known as Peganel. Janet Bradshaw is the CEO and registrar of Peganel, but unfortunately she was unable to attend and she sends her regrets this evening. Peganel is an invaluable asset to our program and our graduates, and we are honored to partner with them to bring you this lecture series this evening. Tonight's talk is about how the exciting field of mechatronics will impact the future digital economy. A new mechatronics engineering program in the faculty will be launched this fall, and it will provide students with an opportunity to meet the demands of the growing technology sector in the province and Canada, and move into careers such as advanced manufacturing systems, robotics, autonomous driving, artificial intelligence, remotely operated underwater and aerial vehicles, among many other exciting fields. During this Speaking of Engineering public lecture, a panel of our very own professors will share their expertise in this important field that will be critical in the future digital economy. But before we begin, just a couple of logistical details. We're going to plan to have time for questions after all of our speakers have spoken. We'll use the Q&A feature, which you should be able to see on the bottom right of your screen. You can type your question in there at any time and we'll go through them at the end. If you wish, you can indicate to which speaker your question should be directed. So let's start with our first speaker this evening. Our first speaker is Dr. Ting Zhu. As I mentioned, she's an assistant professor. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering and a Master of Science degree in Automatic Control Engineering at Jian Jiaotong University in China in 2005 and 2008, respectively. Then she received a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Engineering from McGill University in 2013. She joined then the Center for Intelligent Machines at McGill as a postdoctoral fellow where she worked on the optimum design of next generation transmission for transmission systems rather for electric vehicles and also trajectory tracking and motion control of autonomous tracked vehicles for mining drilling rigs. 
Dr. Zhu's research interests include mechanism design, control of biologically inspired robots, advanced human robot interaction, soft robots, and microelectromechanical systems, or MEMS for short. She's a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, also known as IEEE, and the Canadian Society for Mechanical Engineers. Welcome this evening, Dr. Zhu, and I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you very much, Dr. Nantri. So uh, I will share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to make a short presentation of the research project on electronics in my lab. My presentation today is uh, composed of uh, three sections. In the first section, uh, I will give a brief introduction of uh, mechanics, and then in section two, I like to present uh, the motivation of my research projects. After that, the counter achievements of my research projects, a bio-inspired uh, area robot with uh, morphine wings, the development of a uh, tiny nursing robot with the haptic control, autonomous uh, robotic system for porcupine crab processing, and bio-inspired underwater robot will be presented in section three. All right, so uh, let's take a look at uh, some basics on mechanics first. So mechanics is uh, an integration of uh, multiple fields, including mechanical engineering, electrical and control engineering, and computer science. Mechanics uh, is widely used in our daily life, such as advanced manufacturing, medical service, space exploration, and so on. And also the significant development of AI in recent years drives the further growth of mechanics, like uh, intelligent robotics, advanced uh, sensing, and uh, et cetera. So uh, these uh, two figures below are two textbook examples for the application of mechanics and robotics uh, in our daily life. The first example shown here, left, the, the figure uh, in, uh, on the left uh, is a Da Vinci surgical system, uh, which is designed to implement uh, surgery in a minimally uh, invasive way. So. The interactive robotic arm shown here in this picture are controlled by the surgeon from uh, a console. So the second example uh, is the blue car blue. This is a low cost uh, fast controller robot arm from UC Berkeley. Uh, so this is designed to safely perform human skill tasks. The, the manufacturing cost for uh, this blue robot is around 5,000 uh, US dollars. So it's really a low cost uh, robotic arm. The gentleman, as seen in this figure, the gentleman uh, in the background uh, is uh, using a VR headset and a, a handheld controller to tally operate a blue robot to use a coffee maker. All right, so uh, let's go to section two, an introduction of the uh, motivations of uh, some ongoing electronics projects uh, in my lab. So the first project is a bio-inspired aerial robot with uh, morphine wings. Um, so this is motivated by uh, the increasing need from industry for the next generation flapping wing aerial robots. Uh, in the last few years, we have witnessed a boom in the development of quadrotors. However, uh, risks of uh, high noise, low efficiency, and safety accompany, and will uh, make the room make make a quadrotors not appropriate for a set of applications, including. Uh, ecosystem monitoring and a complex environment survey, et cetera. So on the other hand, the bio-inspired robots with uh, flapping wings or morphine wings have uh, promising potentials for such kinds of applications. For it, so in this, in this project, uh, uh, we are designing a bat-inspired robot with uh, complex uh, wing morphine characteristics to mimic the bat flying behaviors, which has high agility, sorry, in complex uh, environments. However, uh, the current state of the art morphine wing aerial robots are still in infancy and uh, are, are far from industrial needs here. <laughs> so, uh, although it's a, a really uh, a very challenging uh, uh, in the in the design and control aspects, uh, uh, still is very uh, promising to develop uh, and uh, design such type of uh, bio-inspired aerial robot with uh, morphine wings. 
So uh, this is the first project. The second project is uh, the development of a tiny nursing robot uh, of, uh, uh, using the haptic control. So uh, this uh, project uh, is motivated by uh, the urgent need for intelligent uh, remote controlled tiny nursing robot for situations like uh, COVID-19. This is a bright future for the application of uh, tiny nursing robot globally. So a significant uh, achievement has been made on the development of a tiny nursing robot. However, room for improvement on human robot interaction to deal with a soft object, for example, as well as intelligence level also motivates this uh, project. And the third project uh, um, is uh, the development of uh, autonomous robotic system for pocket crab processing. And this is directly uh, motivated by the industrial pattern needs. So porcupine crabs are byproducts often seen in Newfoundland and other parts of uh, Canada. Uh, the long sharp spines, so you, you see the picture later in, in the detailed uh, illustration. So these uh, long sharp spines pose a substantial, uh, pose a substantial challenges for human processing. So uh, on the other hand, no off-the-shelf equipment autonomous equipment actually is, uh, is available for porcupine crab processing for such kind of applications. Moreover, current technical uh, bottlenecks, uh, like tackle complex surface, uh, uh, like a porcupine crab shell, are also challenging. Thus, solving this issue uh, will significantly help overcome a lot of research problems. And the, the last project I, I'm going to introduce is a bio-inspired underwater robot. The technical uh, bottlenecks for low speed and swimming efficiency and the short operating period of the current fish like underwater robots motivate this research project. It also has uh, promising applications like ecosystem monitoring. All right, so uh, these are the current research highlights uh, will be introduced in this section. So the first uh, project is a uh, bat inspired avian robot with uh, the morphing wings design. Um, and as we know, a uh, bat inspired flying robot has uh, many advantages, for example, high movability, low noise, as well as improved flying efficiency. However, the dimensional complexity of a bat flight reaches more than 40 active and passive degrees of freedom. So how to mimic bat morphology should be the top consideration in our design. And here uh, shows a video of the bat flight motion on the left, and on the right uh, is a digital representation we can see the red dots here. These are markers uh, located on the bat wing. Right. Okay, so this figure shows the cat model design of the, our proposed bat inspired aerial robot, and uh, including four steering engines, scissor kinematics, one gear uh, mechanism. So uh, this is another video uh, animation for the for the simulation. So. Here, this video is, uh, uh, shows uh, uh, the simulation results of the wing combined motions of uh, flapping and morphing. So it is apparent that from the video, we can see that the wing motion trajectory shows uh, both the flapping and the folding. And now we are uh, continuing to optimize the robot design for the optimal performance. Okay, so the second project uh, is a tiny nursing robot development uh, listed on this slide. Uh, are the uh, background and motivations for this project uh, as already introduced in section two. So we aim to develop uh, a novel robotic system for tele nursing purpose, uh, protect and ensure the safety of frontline healthcare workers. And uh, as shown uh, in this figure, we can see this is the working principle for the bilateral teleoperation where haptic device and the comparison with the traditional unilateral tally operation. As you can see in this figure for the traditional unilateral tally operation, we have uh, the motion command transmitted from the haptic device to the robotic arm. And uh, uh, for the state-of-the-art bilateral tally operation, besides uh, the motion command transmitted from the haptic device to the arm, we also have the feedback from the arm. So that is the interacting force. And also for this project, we are considering to integrate uh, the AI algorithms. For example, this AI algorithm can be used uh, for solving the inverse kin kinematics problems and also for uh, the estimation of the interacting force and uh, object detection. All right. So um, 
for this project, we, we have a setup of the, the, the test event as shown here. These are equipment that uh, we're using this project. We have the six axis uh, collaborative robot and also uh, the haptic device. And also we have established correct mapping between the robotic arm and the haptic device. We also implemented the teleoperation of the arm where the haptic device. So here are the video I like to show you. Right. So uh, these two videos show the movement of the six axis uh, collaborative robot, we call it a cobot, where teleoperation using the haptic device in real time. Okay. Right. So the third project uh, is a is a porcupine crab processing project. Uh, and uh, we have I've already introduced the, uh, the background and objectives of this project. And this project aims to develop a autonomous robotic system for spine removal. OK, so this is uh, this overview of the system and uh, the methodologies. As you can see here, the first part is a point cloud processing, including these steps. And uh, after that uh, comes the, the robot pass planning part. So as shown here, this is the flow chart. And so I have a, uh, so this figure uh, uh, shows the experimental system uh, in ROS simulation environment. So ROS stands for robotic operating systems. So uh, as you can see here, the, the Pakistan crab shell uh, is modeled using the 3D printing technology and the depth sensor is installed and to the robot to detect the depths of the different points on the shell with respect to the inertial frame. The point cloud data that's being created for further operations. And uh, this uh, demonstrates the point cloud processing and the trajectory planning for the robot arm, which can be seen from uh, this animation in ROS. So we can see here we have the point cloud data with noise and outliner and ideal point cloud data of the crab 3D model. And after that, uh, this shows the ideal point cloud data of the crab shell. And uh, uh, these uh, two figures shows the point cloud data of the crab shell after processing and point cloud slicing based on big points searching and generating rubber to a pass in the trajectory because our final goal is to uh, remove uh, the long sharp spines from the porcupine crab shell. All right, so the last project uh, uh, is uh, the bio-inspired uh, design. Um, for the underwater robot. So that's a fish uh, robot of say robot fish. And uh, you see here the motivation for this project uh, uh, comes from uh, the increasing needs for bio-inspired underwater robots and also the technical bottlenecks, uh, including low speed, limited operating range on water and the short duration period. And we aim uh, to realize and increase the swimming speed, very low cost, and endured operating period by increasing efficiency as well as improved intelligence level. So that's all for my presentation today. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to let me know. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. Xu. That was, that was very interesting and fascinating. With Thank questions, you. I think um, we'll have time at the end after the panelists are finished, but I, I'm sure that there, there will be questions. And in fact, I have a few myself. So thanks again. And Thank you very uh, much. I'd like to move ahead to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Oscar De Silva. Oscar received a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Moratua in Sri Lanka in 2009 and a PhD degree from Memorial in 2015. Following postdoctoral work with the Atlantic Bureau of Shipping's Harsh Environment Technology Center in St. John's, he joined the Department of Mechanical Engineering, where he is currently an assistant professor. Dr. De Silva serves as the lead of Memorial Student Design Hub, artificial intelligence uh, for ice navigation and AI for aerial autonomy research initiatives at Memorial. And he is also the vice chair of the Newfoundland and Labrador section of the IEEE. Dr. De Silva's main research areas include autonomous robotics, navigation systems, and machine learning. 
Welcome, Dr. Silva, Dr. De Silva, and it's over to you now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Netra. So I'll share my screen, and uh, please let me know if you could. Uh, yeah. See it. All good. It is yes. Just full screen mode would yeah. be better. There you go. That's better. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nindra, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you all for joining the, today's uh, Speaking of Engineering Public Lecture. So, for my uh, brief 10 minutes, I'll talk about the uh, Mechatronics Engineering Program that will be starting here at MAN, and also talk about an exciting new area that uh, Mechatronics Engineers can work on, uh, which is uh, drone delivery, and uh, also we talk about a little bit about research that we do in that area to develop our expertise and capabilities in that particular market segment. So first up, uh, as Ting mentioned, I'll do a, like a brief introduction to Mechatronics. Uh, as I see. So uh, I see Mechatronics engineering as a focus on design of a computer controlled machines. So that's that engineer in the engineering design team who focuses on tight integration between uh, machine dynamics control electronics of that machine and control software of that machine. So the uh, different areas uh, they work on, I kind of uh, use a couple of more, showing a couple of more examples uh, for the team here, uh, which are aligned with the Memorial Strategic Research Interest here. So uh, ocean tech and uh, fisheries industries where robotics can you know, safely uh, perform different tasks and also improve productivity. And also biomedical uh, industry where robotics uh, can benefit uh, for human well-being. And the main area that I'll be talking about, robotic logistics, uh, which envisions a future where robotics can uh, uh, perform logistical operations safer, safer, faster, and in much more economical ways. So this is uh, very important for remote communities across Canada and also remote cities across Canada to make things more sustainable uh, in the future. So uh, how is the Mechatronics program arranged? So it, it starts with a mechanical engineering base. And uh, so this is just a, like a draft of the proposed program. And it has a like an electrical engineering uh, strong fundamentals, which focus on circuit design and also mechanical uh, mechatronic engineering courses, progressively advancing the students to be uh, cap highly capable uh, in the industrial automation arena. So there will be focus on a bunch of uh, highly specialized softwares, which is highly sought after uh, for startups and also in the industry itself. And uh, they have the benefits of the Mund Engineering uh, Co-op Engineering Program uh, and also the Mund Student Design Hub, uh, which mentors students for uh, to lead in national student design competitions like Hyperloop. CubeSat and recent initiatives like the F110 competition, uh, not to mention the uh, Mount Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, which is another uh, important aspect uh, at uh, Memorial Engineering, engineering which uh, lets students uh, start on their high growth startup ideas uh, by the time they graduate. So this is just a basic introduction into the uh, Mechatronics Engineering Program at Mount. And of course, during the question and answer session, we'd be happy to uh, discuss more on that. So I'll move on to uh, the research stuff that I was uh, uh, planning to discuss. So uh, particularly in the area of uh, drone delivery or robotic logistics, which would be an exciting new area where mechatronics engineers and engineers gen in general will engage in, uh, in the near future. So current, uh, state of the art in this particular segment include like highly specialized drones like these, which are made to carry small payloads uh, across different locations from point A to point B, let's say, uh, using mainly GPS navigation. So the safety uh, of these uh, devices are ensured uh, by a high level of pre-planning so that human injury risk is reduced uh, by planning the paths where you know, you don't encounter that much human traffic and also using a bunch of supplementary data sources like weather information and GPS information to keep things safe uh, as possible uh, during flight. 
because we are dealing with autonomous flight, so there sh should not be any room for failure there. Um, so this particular company, uh, Drone Delivery Canada, has already started small-scale operations, which serves as technology demonstration in this arena. And the future uh, of this particular segment looks at uh, fully autonomous large aircrafts that can actually do logistical operations, logistical operations like uh, cargo transport, like using uh, uh, like uh, uh, cargo drones like these, and also personal transport uh, using uh, like systems or aircrafts which require very minimal user input to go from point A to point B. So making it more accessible for uh, personal transport in the future. So the end game is uh, more faster, uh, more cost effective and more safer uh, means of transport to enable uh, both personal and logistical transport. So, and as I mentioned, it'll be like a, a highly a valuable thing for remote communities and also for remotely located cities to make things, keep things economical uh, in the future. So what's driving this uh, technology is mainly safety. And uh, there are many research institutions engaged in, uh, engaged in this work, including uh, Memorial University and also National Research Council of Canada. So uh, here at uh, Memorial University, uh, we are looking at uh, like how we could contribute to this uh, particular arena. And uh, one of the ways is looking at more safer navigation architectures to help with it. So currently, uh, like the GPS waypoint navigation that I mentioned uh, mainly relies on GPS and inertial data and uh, things like Google Maps or pre-recorded maps that are available to go from point A to point B. But in this kind of architecture, uh, the most um, like the important missing element is environmental perception, a uh, real time. That is to know what are the obstacles that are around in the environment and to keep a safe distance from those obstacles to know different critical targets like humans and uh, critical infrastructure where regulatory compliance should be uh, you know, adhered to. And also to have some redundancy in the system so that in case GPS fails, how the robot can safely figure out a landing zone and you know, land automatically. So for that, uh, we're looking at this kind of architecture where LIDARs, cameras, and uh, initial measurement units together can actually provide a navigation solution, uh, which includes a map which is built real time in the environment and the aircraft can be located within that map. So the, in real time, the aircraft can stay away from these uh, like critical targets so that it's safer for it to operate. Coupled with that, we have uh, place recognition or you know figuring out like the place where it is and figuring out like critical landing zones where it can land in case of an emergency and in case with, uh, when it's approaching uh, the landing uh, zone. So these are a couple of uh, snapshots of uh, like uh, where we are in that particular project. So uh, these are like, uh, like highly integrated systems that students here at Memorial have developed and uh, actually manufactured. So this is that on the roof of, uh, roof of a car. And uh, this integrates mechanical, in, uh, like a mechanically integrates a bunch of sensors and uh, has custom electronics and custom software to do the, uh, like achieve the capability that I just mentioned. And it's, it was, uh, you know, tested on large scale drones and it's, it's, uh, it's about to be tested on a, like a full scale aircraft, uh, the Bell 412 within RC camp. And a couple of more screenshots. So uh, like these are the maps that it generates real time so that it can figure out uh, where it is. So this is a drive that we did up Signal Hill and this is the map that it generates. So without any use of GPS, it can figure out where it is with respect to all the obstacles around the environment. So it can do it safely. And also this is uh, another map uh, at uh, Holy Road Marine Base uh, uh, down at Holy Road where it can figure out like the places where that aircraft can land safely uh, like uh, by using AI. So the system is still under development, but uh, we're looking into ways, you know, where we can incorporate or in, like, enable the technology that I just mentioned. So uh, the next steps is to kind of go for technology demonstrations in this area. And, uh, and all of these learnings come into 
like the courses that we offer here at MUN. So mainly, I would like to highlight the ME7220 course, uh, Guidance Navigation and Control for Autonomy course, which will be offered in this spring. So if any students are joining in this call, so you're welcome to have a look there as a technical elective for term seven. So thank you. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Nitra. Well, uh, thank you very much, Oscar. That was also intriguing. So many applications that I could see. One of them that uh, right off the top that would be amazing is to incorporate some of this for search and rescue, I think would have a huge potential there. So uh, amazing what's going on. Thank you, Oscar, for the presentation. Again, for those who have questions, I think we'll save those to the end. And I would like to move ahead with our third speaker and introduce Dr. Andrew Vardy. Dr. Vardy is a jointly appointed faculty member to the Department of Computer Science and the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Memorial. He completed a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Electrical Engineering from Memorial in 1999, a Master of Science degree in Evolutionary and Adaptive Systems from the University of Sussex in 2000, and a Doctor of Philosophy in Computer Science from Carleton University in 2005. Dr. Vardy's main research areas involve swarm robotics, but he, is also, he has also developed new techniques in visual robotic navigation. He leads the Bio-Inspired Robotics Group at Memorial, which is focused on developing swarms of robots that can actively organize their environments by sorting objects or cleaning a space. An interesting fact about Dr. Vardy is that his work in swarm robotics led to the name Vardy being used for a swarm of robots in season 10 of BBC's Doctor Who. Wow, that's a, that's a fun neat fact. Welcome, Dr. Vardy, and I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Nadur. Um, can I just, would you mind just checking that uh, you can see my screen there? Yes, I can see it. Just uh, do the full screen again. Okay. Where's my little button hiding? Good. It may be just doing, does that look okay? Not yet. Oh dear. It's just, it's just showing the slide view rather than the full screen view. Okay, let me just, I'm gonna just share that in a slightly different way then. I'm gonna share my screen rather than the application. I think it's being that, tricky. That works. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So, um, thank you very much, Dr. Nederer, for the introduction. So, uh, I thought I would take the time, uh, this, this relatively short session of, uh, uh, section of the session of 10 minutes to give a little case study of what I consider to be mechatronics, a good example of mechatronics. Um, so let me dive right in. So there are many definitions one can find of the term mechatronics, and here's one that sort of jumped out at me. So mechatronics is an approach aiming at the synergistic integration of mechanics, electronics, control theory, and computer science. So there's a lot of words in there. Synergistic integration is the term that sort of jumped out. So we think of mechatronics as being somehow a combination of disciplines. Uh, but how does that work and what is good about combining disciplines together? So, and I think the key is in that term synergy, synergistic uh, integration. Now, what does the word synergy mean? Well, synergy implies the idea of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. So um, you might say, you know, if, if you have synergy, then two plus two can be greater than four. So we know that's not true mathematically, but from a metaphorical sense, it may be that the components of your system can combine together to create something greater than the parts. So that's what synergy is. So a good mechatronics engineer, I think, seeks ways of achieving synergy by considering how these different aspects, the mechanical aspects, the electrical and the computational aspects fit together. So I wanted to, that's kind of a hard concept to talk about. So I want to talk about it through an example. Now, the example I've chosen is not 
uh, is related to my research, but it's not a product of my research. Uh, it's uh, from a uh, project at Harvard University um, where they're interested in studying um, collective uh, robotics and collective behavior in systems. So this is one example of the type of system um, of interest, uh, which is self-assembly. So you have a bunch of little robots that assemble together as a collective into a desired shape. So on the left, it's a star shape, and on the right, it's the shape of the letter K. Now, so that's the kind of the larger problem, but it doesn't relate too much to mechatronics. But if you look at the design of the robots to achieve this, then we see the real mechatronics flare, I think. Um, so the constraints, and all engineering problems have constraints, is that we'd like to have hundreds or even thousands of robots operating together. And to achieve that, we don't want them to be too big. So they have to be kind of small individually. And of course, they have to be relatively inexpensive individually. Uh, target price, like less than $20 per robot. But not only that, they can't just be cheap. They have to be scalable. So you have to have, think about how, if you have this number of robots, how do you program them all at once? How do you recharge them? So if you have to go around pressing an on button or flicking an on switch in all these robots, that's just going to take a lot of time. It's not scalable. So those are the constraints. So the solution that uh, this group at Harvard came up with is called the Kilobot. It looks like this. This is the Kilobot next to an American quarter, which is about the same size as a Canadian quarter. Uh, and uh, this is a large group of them. Now they're called kilobots, not because they kill anything. It's they're named after the prefix kilo, uh, which in computing we tend to think of kilo as not ten to the three, but two to the ten, which is uh, thousand twenty four bytes, as in a kilobyte. Okay, so they're very friendly robots. Don't don't worry about anything killing anything. Now, how do these things move around? Well, uh, traditional mobile robots generally are driven by a pair of wheels or a pair of tracks. And there are a variety of other more elaborate mechanisms, but this is a common uh, modality. But uh, at the scale that we're talking about here, very inexpensive robots, this doesn't work so well. Um, so what the designers of the kilobots proposed is something rather different. Um, so this is a close-up picture of a kilobot, and you see these disks here labeled A. Those are actually pager motors. Now, you have probably one of those in your pocket now, because pager motors are used to provide the vibration feature in, in your phone when it, when it vibrates to indicate some notification. Um, now, those motors just provide a, a vibration that's, uh, that's designed to be off-center, and the vibration carries down into these legs, which are just really metal posts. And um, the, those two things, uh, there, there's a sort of a pattern of sticking and then releasing at the bottom of the leg that leads to motion when you drive these two uh, motors independently. So I have a little video that illustrates this the motion. Each kilowatt can independently control its vibration motors to rotate in either direction as well as move. So there you can see you can drive one motor at a time to achieve counterclockwise or clockwise motion, and you can drive both motors to achieve forwards motion. Easy to operate hundreds or thousands. Now, I don't want to uh, linger on the video too long there. Um, now, how do you control these these uh, these robots, and how are they? Um, what is their what com computational power do they have? Well, they're controlled by a microcontroller. So a microcontroller is basically an all-in-one computer where the computer's memory and the central processing unit are all housed in one chip. And for these robots, and as often is the case, uh, the programming language used is, is C. Now, the communication between robots is uh, achieved via infrared. So at the base, at the on the underside of each robot is an infrared receiver and an infrared transmitter, relatively wide angle. So when a robot wants to communicate, 
it emits a, a pattern of infrared pulses and other robots in the vicinity can pick up on that pattern. Um, there's a shared communication medium and there can be collisions, but there are, there are strategies to, to mitigate that. So they communicate via these two little devices, an infrared receiver and an infra infrared transmitter. Um, now, how are you going to program a large group of robots? Are you going to, you know, hook a USB port uh, or cord into each of them? Not, not very efficient to do that. They actually program them using, uh, also using infrared. So they have basically this device here, which, um, uh, which uh, has a bunch of uh, infrared LEDs, and that communicates to this large group of robots by bouncing the infrared light off the table and up to, to be received by the robots. So this is our first example of synergy, because you can see that the design for the communication aspect and the design for programming, they fit together. So it's not like we decide, they decided to implement a different type of protocol or a different technology, they use the same thing. The, these, these two aspects fit together, perfect example of synergy. And we get another example of synergy when we consider how these things are powered. So as you can imagine, changing the batteries for a thousand robots would be untenable. Um, so rather than have, you know, um, have someone have to go around and individually change batteries, these robots have recharge about rechargeable batteries and they can last at least three months, at least three months in sleep mode. And then we can charge them by applying uh, a voltage across the, the, I'll show you the picture. Uh, we just need to, to charge an individual robot. We apply a voltage uh, between this uh, connector on the top and one of the metal legs. So remember, this robot has this unique and unusual method of propulsion of sort of vibrating, uh, vibration connected to metal legs. And that means you can actually take a, a stick, an ordinary stick, and you can sweep all the robots together to form uh, so that they lie on a, um, a conductive metallic coating on the surface. Then you can put a, another piece of metal on top of them, squashing down all those springs that you see. And then you put uh, six volts through the, uh, in the floor, the robot's floor, and then a ground uh, voltage uh, above and then you can charge this large group of robots all at once. Um, so this is something you can do because the propulsion method supports it. If we put little, if they had put little rubber wheels on these robots, then you'd have to establish some other point of contact. So this is another example of synergy, okay? Where the, the different aspects of the design fit together in a very neat way. So, just to summarize, this kilowatt is an example of a mechatronic system, and we can see the synergy between the mechanical design, the electrical design, and the computer system. Everything sort of fits together, and there are compromises and trade-offs made, uh, but those are all in, in service of having a system that satisfies the constraints. So um, I want you to maybe just think about that as you think about mechatronics. And is that kind of idea of combining these, these lessons learned and these aspects of different disciplines together, does that appeal to you? Um, and if it does, I think you're, you're going to have uh, a very flourishing career because you could work in obviously robotics. I, I'm a roboticist, so I presented an example from robotics, but there's examples one could choose from the Internet of Things, biomedical applications, automation, avionics, which is aircraft instrumentation and control, all kinds of interesting opportunities and areas to study. So thanks very much for your attention. I look forward to any questions at the end. Dr. Vardy, thank you very much. Uh, presentation was really enlightening. And I think the example that you gave of that kilowatt is, is a great one too explain that concept of synergy that you you uh, you described is a, is a great descriptor for what mechatronics engineering is about. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, we are going to move ahead and we have 
one last speaker before we open it up to questions, and that is Dr. Mohammed Al Janade. He has been an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering since 2017. Prior to joining Memorial, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto and in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Michigan. He has worked as a senior mechatronic and control engineer at ASML in Wilton, Connecticut, and he is a technical editor of the IEEE Transactions on Mechatronics, as well as a technical editor for the IEEE Conference on Decision and Control and the American Control Conference. Dr. El Janade's research interests include the design and control of precision motion stages for future wafer scanners, fault detection, and mitigation of connected autonomous robotic networks, as well as microelectromechanical system design for piezo engine energy harvesting. Rather, those are basically very small scale micro scale systems that can, uh, I guess, absorb energy from the environment or or elsewhere, which is energy harvesting essentially. So. Welcome, Dr. El Janade, and I'd like to pass it over to you to, to begin your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Natter, for uh, the kind introduction. So, in this talk, I will focus on what we are doing in microsystems and mechatronics. And here I will share uh, our current activities at the Micro Precision Mechatronics Lab at Memorial University. I would like to thank Dr. Teng Zhu and Dr. Scott De Silva and Dr. Andrew Vardy for the introduction of mechatronics. So now we're going to microsystems and nanobushing with mechatronics. So uh, okay. So I'll start with current research activities that we have um, in the micro precision mechatronics lab. So the first uh, uh, research activities focuses on design precision motion systems for the wave. For yes. So these are um, lithography machines. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. You, you were stuck on the first page for a while, but now I see that you went to the second page. Good. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the first research activities focus here on design and precision motion systems for the wafer scanners and wafer scanners, uh, big machines that manufacture the integrated circuits, which are the main elements that we have in micro uh, processors. And sorry. I'd like to reshare again. Screen. Okay, so here uh, our focus uh, uh, on design electromagnetic actuator for to develop the short stroke motion that we have in these uh, systems and also to develop new motion profiles for scanning motions within the scan this uh, wafer scanner. So the impact of this research activities in precision mechatronics lithography machine will lead to enhance the lithography process to manufacture faster, smarter, lighter integrated circuits. So these integrated circuits are the main elements that we have within the micro processors. So this is the first research activities. The second one that we have is on connected autonomous vehicles, specifically control algorithms to have health monitoring of the future connected autonomous vehicles that consider communication time delays between the vehicles when they share the information about the velocity and the acceleration on the roads. The impact of this research development of safety stability of the future connected autonomous vehicles network. Now, the third research activity, which is design MEMS energy harvesting, and this is collaboration with Professor Liang Zhang in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And here we consider deep learning based optimization in order to design piezo MEMS um, uh, uh, energy harvesting that can use the ambient vibrations that we have within the environment. And the impact here is to provide a sustainable power supply that can replace current 
conventional batteries having and providing zero carbon energy. So here I present the current research activities that we have now. I will start to give uh, just uh, uh, some details about these activities. So here I start with the wafer scanners. Now, um, to present the impact of the wafer scanners and mechatronics, uh, I would like to ask the following question. Now, if we decide to use a microprocessor that's manufactured in 1980s to build the current smartphones that we have, and we need to have the same performance and efficiency of the current smartphones. In other words, we're going to pick a microprocessor manufactured in 1980s, and we need to um, build and design smartphones, the one that we have, and to have the same performance and efficiency. Now, the size will be big, and this can be handled of, uh, by the Statue of Liberty. And actually, the length of such phone with microprocessor manufactured in 1980s will exceed the 20 meters to have the same performance and efficiency. Now, because of the development that we have within precision mechatronics control system, precision engineering, we currently have easy to use smartphones and, um, uh, 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 and cell phones. Now, actually, I was um, engineer at a senior uh, mechatronics and control engineer at ASML, which is the most well-known supplier for these systems, and is currently used at Intel, Samsung, and also HP manufacture their uh, microprocessors. So to give you like uh, some uh, um, background on wafer scanners from mechatronics point of view, actually we have two important characteristics. The first one is the resolution. Now, resolution is the minimum structural gap, the minimum distance that we can have between any two electronic components in the NSS. Now, currently, the ASML machines or the other suppliers, Nikon Japan machines, can provide 7 to 10 nanometers, minimum distance between any two electronic uh, 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 elements within the integrated circuits. Now, if we can reduce this structural gap by enhancing control systems, motion control, uh, uh, the sensors that we have within these machines, then we can minimize the structural gap. And then we can add more electronic components to have smarter and lighter integrated circuits, and this will develop the microprocessors. Another uh, characteristic that we have throughput, currently the throughput is 270 to 195 wafer per hour for scanner systems. Now, to give you some uh, information about resolution, this was 25 micrometers in 1959 currently we have between 7 to 10 nanometers and with this 7 to 10 to 10 nanometers we currently uh happy with our device that we have like cell phones tablets pcs with this uh, 10 7 however number of challenges here i provide two examples the first one microprocessors of the autonomous vehicles based on intel uh, uh, these vehicles will consume 4,000 gigabyte per day, and current microprocessors cannot handle such big size of data. Another challenge that we have with scanners is new era, which is the era of artificial uh, intelligence. We currently start to have the new era for artificial intelligence, and here we need to have also very efficient microprocessor that can handle such size of big size of data from the machine learning and the artificial intelligence techniques that we have. Now, here I will present one of uh, our contributions to develop the wafer scanners, and also I will um, here provide some activities that we have in the lab, and I would like to mention that uh, this, um, uh, this proposal or this project recently accepted by lab to market and insert for commercialization. So I will This is a demonstration of the development of an electromagnetic reluctance motion actuator for scanning and advanced manufacturing applications for Industry 4.0. To begin, we designed and 3D printed enclosures to house the ENC data core along with the mover, which is called the I-beam. A specialized soft magnetic alloy is used for the core material. The coils are wrapped manually and then inserted onto the cores. These are then housed inside the 3D printed enclosures. <clears throat> The E core setup can be seen here, followed by the C core. Here is the I beam enclosure and the force bracket along with the force sensors. Now we can insert the I beam enclosure onto the C core enclosure. 
The force can then be measured with the four sensors, as described by the schematic. And here's a quick demonstration of the actuator in action. And as you can see, as we increase the current, the force goes up, as highlighted in the plot. And if we try to pull apart or separate the two enclosures, you can see that the force is resisting this action, but it's only 100 newtons. So if we pull hard enough, we'll be able to separate them. And we just want to thank you very much for your time. This is a day. Now we'll move to the second uh, research interest, connected autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, as we know. These systems include cyber physical uh, network. So we have networking, computation, and physical process. So within um, the first generation of connected autonomous vehicles, we have three main elements. We have cyber components. So we have communication links between um, the vehicles to share information about the velocity acceleration. We can't ignore the human driven vehicle from the first generation of connected autonomous vehicles. Closed loop system to model the dynamics that we have. Now, based on this technology, we have four main challenges that will affect the, um, the progress within this technology. And here we include, uh, and here I present these uh, four technologies uh, challenges. The first one, false data injection, cyber attack within uh, the network of these autonomous vehicles. The high nonlinear dynamics due to the human driven vehicle, human within the loop. The non disturbances that may affect any closed loop system and communication delay within the cyber components. It's clear now with these four challenges, security, safety, and stability cannot be ha handled within these systems. And it's important here to develop control systems, health monitoring, fault detection systems in order to handle the stability of uh, these systems. Now, here I present one of the contributions that we have. We recently developed uh, a new algorithm that can be used with connected autonomous vehicles. And uh, within this algorithm, we can have fault detection, localization, and also mitigation. And here we use the principle of transmissibility operators. And here I, um, I present a video. So here we have the three robots to represent the connected autonomous vehicles. They are connected using a network. So we have networked robotic systems. And here we will insert three types of attacks or faults within robot number two. So we'll have noise injection within the cyber component. We'll have cyber physical attacks in, in robot number two, and then a time delay between the connection of robot number one and robot number two. Now, using the algorithm that we pro proposed here, it's clear that we can detect, localize the fault, and activate a nonlinear control system that can stabilize uh, stabilize uh, uh, the connected autonomous vehicles. And the novelty within this algorithm that we don't need to know the uh, dynamic of the vehicles, or we need we don't need to measure uh, we need we don't need to consider any desired input. We just now for the third uh, research activities, it's MEMS energy harvesting. So um, the main idea here is to design piezoelectric MEMS energy harvesting in order to power environmental sensors. And the novelty here is to consider machine learning, deep learning optimization in order to optimize and to enhance the performance of these um, uh, MEMS energy harvesting. So this is just an example that we have uh, 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 recently. So this is a structure. We can use uh, uh, fabrication at CMC microsystems in Kingston. And this is the set up where we have the shaker in order to test uh, the piece of energy harvesters. And this is the um, uh, deep learning that we use in order to design this structure. And just example here at 130 hertz, we can have now 0.7 uh, uh, volt. And actually we're currently working on to also minimize this frequency to power environmental um, sensors and sensors that we have within the ocean. So um, uh, actually here, I would like to acknowledge uh, financial support from Memorial, NSEC, CFI, MITAX, CMC, HMC in Ottawa, and the Czech Academy of Sciences. And thank you very much. Mohammed, very, very good presentation. and. Uh, I'm interested to see that you're collaborating with European partners as well too, France and and uh, the Czech Republic. That's that's great. Um, Thank you. That concludes our four presentations. At this point, I would like to.
um, just invite the audience if there are questions. I'd like to begin the question and answer period. And again, if you could indicate so in the um, the Q and A box, I'm just going to go back and repeat what I said earlier. To use the Q and A feature, you should be able to see that on the bottom right of your screen. Type your question in there, and we'll try to go go through the list. Okay, I'm just scrolling through them now and. Okay, so this isn't um, directed at anyone in particular, all four. How many students will be accepted into the mechatronics program in term three? And will the class sizes be increased or decreased for courses like ECE 3400, ECE 3300, as they are also taken by electrical and computer engineering students to accommodate for the mechatronics majors. Okay, maybe I could, uh, I'll take the first part. Um, I anticipate around 30 students going into term three initially. That might, that would probably grow, I think, over time, over to 40, but I think initially 30 into term three. Um, the second part is, will class sizes be increased or decreased? I think this, the class sizes uh, in some cases would be larger, but if the sections become too large, like over 90 students, they would be separated into to two different sections. In that case, the classes actually could be smaller. Hope that answers that one. I'm just going to continue on. Um, Okay, I'm wondering if any resources or programs will be dedicated to helping current students. Um, past engineering one transition to the new major if they wish and if they and if any accelerated custom accommodations will be offered to help those students graduate. So current students, uh, we don't have a plan for them to transition into this new program because the the courses would be um, unique uh, in the term three. So the plan is that uh, actually the engineering one students in this program would begin in the fall 2022 and term three would begin in the fall of 2023. Um, so uh, there isn't a plan for students in mechanical, electrical or others to be able to just transition into mechatronics because the, the courses are actually different. It's a different program. Okay, I will go on to the next question. What would be the path for a first year engineering student to proceed into a mechatronics engineering program? And uh, actually, rather than me kind of taking all the time here, I could open it up to our panel members. Oscar, you were very instrumental in setting up the curriculum. Would you like to take that one? Yeah, sure, Dr. Nitro. So uh, actually the current uh, engineering one students uh, like uh, I don't think they have a path for this new program, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Nitro. Yeah. So it, it'll be uh, starting from the uh, like from the 2023 uh, September, right, Dr. Nitro? Yeah. If I'm not yes. Mistaken. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but there are like uh, technical electives which are proposed for the new uh, mechatronics program, which is already available as technical electives for current students. For instance, in electrical and mechanical engineering. So these courses are coming in. So for instance, one of the courses that I mentioned, it has already come in uh, like as a technical elective for those who are interested to kind of specialize in this area. So although your degree certificate does not say mechatronics engineering, you're getting that training in that area uh, of the subjects that you like, if you wish. So that's my answer to that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Would you say mechatronics engineering is more electrically or mechanically related? Dr. Zhu, would you like to comment on that? Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitro. So uh, I would say, uh, as uh, presented by all the panelists, uh, electronics engineering itself is interdisciplinary. So <laughs> I would say uh, both the knowledge from uh, electrical engineering and the mechanical engineering also 
control engineering as well as uh, computer science will be equally important. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, good answer, very good. Thank you for the great presentations. I enjoyed them very much. A question for me is, as a computer engineer term five student, how can I join Mechatronics? When I started my degree, I wanted to do Mechatronics, but at the same time, it wasn't available. Hmm, good question. Um, I'll just maybe rotate among the panel. Dr. Vardy, would you care to take that one? Um, well, I, I guess uh, I guess this has been asked about you know current students. Can they? Is there a path for current students? And it's basically the answer seems to be a clear no. There's no path for current students to join the mechatronics program, but you can avail of courses that are you know mechatronically inclined, and more and more will be offered. I guess as as the mechatronic program gets going. Yes. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I was just going to say electrical, computer engineering, mechanical engineering students all have some flexibility. So it, it becomes necessary if you want to explore mechatronics to sort of identify what are the, what are the technical electives that are closest to that area? And uh, I think you can, you can sway your program to be to in that direction. Absolutely. And for, for those of you who are interested in, you know, further advanced studies after your undergraduate degree, I think um, with an undergraduate degree in computer, electrical, or mechanical engineering, you may want to consider a graduate studies in the area of mechatronics. That would be another option for you. Hey, okay, a question from Silicon Valley. I'm curious as to when the first cohort of co-op mechatronics students will be available to hire. Also, will the co-op terms remain at four months or longer, eight to 12 months? I think I could, I'll take that one. First cohort of uh, co-op mechatronics students, um, I think the summer of 2023, because students coming to Memorial interested in to start in mechatronics in first year will have finished that and may be available for a co-op work term in the spring of 2023 or Otherwise, um, the winter term of 2024, those would be the first ones. Second part, will co-op work terms remain at four months or longer terms at eight to 12 months? And good news is the faculty has recently um, launched a new initiative that does allow longer work terms of eight or 12 months, uh, but those are in senior terms of uh, students that are in their program. So. Four months for the junior years, but then when, when students are in their final year, they, they do have that option of a longer work term. That's a new initiative that we've started. Does an average of 75 in engineering one assure that we will get into mechatronics? Um, yeah, that's a good average after engineering one. It is competitive entry into term three in the fall, as you know. Uh, but I, I think that you you have a safe bet of getting into mechatronics with that that average. That's that is a good average. Okay, as an incoming term seven student, I have a few concerns about my strengths in terms of programming. Despite being very interested in the field, I think my question would be more: Are there certain strengths I should look into before deciding to specialize in mechatronics? Um, Dr. Al Janade, um, would you care to take that one? Yeah, actually, I teach uh, Term 7 Mechatronics too. So actually, we usually like provide the student tutorials. So if they don't have like background in programming or simulink or coding, we usually provide them like uh, tutorials in order to build such a background. So uh, whatever that the student's background within the first like uh, um, six terms of uh, like in mechanical engineering, we usually like to provide uh, good help and tutorials if, uh, if we feel that they have uh, like a background for mechatronics. So this is not uh, a, a, a problem based on our experience in mechatronics too. Hey, thank you. Your, si your signal is a little, uh, a bit shaking up there, Mohammed, but we'll continue on. I, 
my goodness, I'm surprised. There's so many questions here. That's that's great. A lot of interest. I'll have to start moving quickly. I'd like to try to get through all of them because I see many interested students are on the line. Okay. So the next question, just to confirm, term three of the first uh, mechatronics cohort is 2023. Correct. Fall 2023, first cohort. Can you apply for mechatronics this coming fall if you are currently in engineering one? Um, so you're in engineering one now. Uh, you could apply to mechatronics, but the term three wouldn't happen until 2023. So you might lose a year, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question because it is starting term three is the fall of 2023. How are mechatronics engineering oops, job prospects compared to other fields of engineering? That's an excellent question. I open that up to the panel. What are some jobs and areas where mechatronics engineers can work? Say maybe a few from the some from the province and others outside the province. Anyone on the panel? Yeah, I think uh, um, so for uh, mechatronics uh, engineering students, uh, 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 graduates, I mean, they, they can work in uh, like a robotics company and also some research institute and also aerospace engineering, very promising future actually have a lot of choices. So, yeah. Excellent. Perhaps I can chime in. Uh, yes. In terms of robotics, there's there's not a huge number of companies locally. There's notably, there's one with robotics in the title, Kraken Robotics, which is interested in under, under, undersea systems. Um, and there are, you know, uh, every, uh, the automotive industry is uh, investing extremely heavily in, um, in uh, autonomous driving. Well, they were pretty resistant to it for a while, but now they're more, more interested. And so they are, they're uh, hiring people um, you know, both for the practical elements and for the research elements of that. Um, so, I mean, that's a big industry. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, industries, anything related to sensors uh, tends to have mechatronic elements. There's, there's a local company called Low Tech um, because I think mechatronic concerns come when you are, you know, boxed in. You don't have a lot of... Uh, you have to survive for uh, your your device has to survive without power for a long period. So something that's immersed in water or sent to space or put on a satellite, um, then you know mechatronic sort of concerns I think become more to the fore. Um, so looking at those kind of industries where 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 you have to um, survive, you know, if for long durations with low power or very stringent operating conditions like aviation. Yeah. Good answer. So to add that, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Vadi. So um, yeah. I'm thinking that uh, there are also some robotic company out of Newfoundland, like uh, in Quebec, uh, in Montreal, they have uh, uh, several startup company on robotics and also a well established company uh, in Montreal is called the CM Labs. They also hire robotics related, not Chinese related graduate students. Thank you. And if I may add, I think also in the traditional industries in the province, oil and gas and mining, mineral processing, even fisheries, there's there's a lot of sens sensors, instrumentation, intelligence in, in these in technologies that are being used there in the equipment uh, as well. So I think there are also some opportunities in those, but good answers. And I will go to the next one. There used to be a mechatronics engineering specialization. If you chose the mecha mechanical engineering field, how does it compare to the mechatronics engineering major? Um, so the, the uh, specialization in mechanical engineering will probably go away when mechatronics engineering is launched as a new program. And the difference being that there is just more focus, more courses, more in-depth knowledge gained by students with the separate program compared to the specialization. Okay, next, I'm wondering what kind of electives will be available in later terms for students to pursue more specific areas, such as biomedical robotics. Um, Dr. De Silva, could you take that one? You were 
very instrumental in developing that course map. Electives. Yes, so in terms of biomedical, we already have uh, like a course that's there. I think engineering medicine, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. But like in a biomedical sense, depending on the area that you're uh, interested in, whether it's biomedical robotics, biomedical sensing, or biomedical signal processing, there are technical electives which uh, works on those fundamentals like digital signal processing, uh, which which is which can be taken as an elective as a mechanical engineer engineering uh, in the mechanical engineering program, if I'm not mistaken, and also uh, things like artificial intelligence courses that are there. Uh, but that has a very high uh, demand inside the university. So if you're interested in that area, you should actually uh, put in your name down uh, early on to uh, to be listed in those uh, type of courses. Uh, so that's so if anyone in the else in the panel has anything to chime in, uh, please feel free. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There's also a uh, elective in ocean, naval, architectural engineering with underwater um, autonomous robotic vehicles as well, and, and some other uh, electives in, in senior years that will be available. Okay, another question. I just got graduated from computer science and I'm very interested in robotics. Would you recommend a double bachelor in computer science and mechatronics? or a master's in mechatronics be better? Well, I, I, I must admit I'm, I'm a little biased towards engineering. As the Dean of Engineering, I would highly recommend our awesome programs that we have in engineering. And of course, computer science is, is a great discipline as well, but we have mechatronics uh, undergraduate program at the graduate studies level as well, since you already graduated. So that's something I would recommend. Uh, is mechatronics available to current engineering one students? Um, not the program yet, but probably there is a mechatronics course maybe that you would be able to take once you're in a mechanical or electrical program starting in term three. Okay, what is an example of a system in place to mitigate kilobot collision? I think that's a question for you, Dr. Vardy. Yes, I, I think I, I typed in an answer. I'm not sure if it got communicated. Uh, oh, yes. But, uh, but yeah, yeah the, the kilobots are, will probably bump into each other because they have relatively poor sensors. They can only sense the distances of other robots. So they will tend to experience a certain amount of collision amongst robots, um, which since they are actually quite slowly moving is not terribly detrimental. And the fact that they're circles usually mean if they collide with each other, they can still turn on the spot and move off in a new direction. But uh, handling collisions amongst a large group of robots is a, a quite an issue um, and uh, something I'm interested in uh, personally. And I know uh, Dr. De Silva also has an interest in. And so that's an active area of research. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. My question is for Dr. Natter, of the 30 to 40 students you expect in the mechatronics major, will they be additional admissions or will they theoretically reduce the number enrolled in other majors? So there's three parts to this question. It's a very good one. We anticipate that it, uh, at least 20 or more will be new students from outside the province uh, or internationally that will come to Memorial who would otherwise not have come because if we didn't have mechatronics. So really new incremental students. The second part of it is that um, we are competitive entry into term three. So there are actually students that are admissible into term three, but, but don't make it. They're not accepted because we have limited uh, seat capacity for students in term three. So. In other words, we would be able to admit more students into our engineering programs that we otherwise haven't been able to do because the total seat capacity has increased. That's the second part. And then thirdly, yes, there may be some students um, that were in mechanical engineering or electrical that were interested in mechatronics that would now take this program, but I, I uh, I think that would be the, the minority of the cases that I just explained. So that answers that question, I hope. Next one, 
over half of my product design team are mechatronics engineers. At least 15 people. I'm at Apple. Wow, there you go. That's uh, uh, of much interest, I'm sure, to students on the line to see how many mechatronics engineers there are at Apple, a lot. Dr. Glenn George, information for previous question, a student promoted to academic term three with an engineering one promotion average of 75% or greater is guaranteed their preferred major. Thank you very much, Dr. George, for that uh, helpful clarification. Um, next, I'm currently in engineering one. I won't be able to take mechatronics in the fall 2022, but I am interested in autonomous vehicles. I would like to know what could be an alternative major. Anyone on the panel want to take that one? Interested in autonomous vehicles. What I would recommend? I'm biased, but I'd say mechanical engineering. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Like uh, this, this uh, currently the as you mentioned the mecha mechatronic stream option there. Yes. And as we go on the uh, like the courses that are there for mechatronics engineering appears as technical electives for those students that are already there. So as I mentioned, okay. the guidance navigation and control course that's there for term seven that I mentioned that starting this spring is actually focused in this autonomous uh, uh, like like self cast type. Uh, application algorithms. So, and you can take that course even if you are in electrical engineering. So make your pick, but I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Is well, the first... Maybe I'll chime in. Uh, well, yes. shall I chime in just on behalf of computer science? Yes, <laughs> yes, please go, go right ahead. Um, but yeah, well, I, I would actually, I don't actually disagree. I think uh, Dr. De Silva is right in terms of uh, the, the course he mentioned. Uh, is is very much aligned with what you'd want to understand for autonomous driving, uh, but on, autonomous driving in general is 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 a topic. You know, you can study more from the mechanical perspective, or you can study more from the computational perspective. So the the a, a backing in com computer science or computer engineering, um, both will be useful for for that domain generally. Um, but I think, yeah. Still, mechanical engineering also a very good option. Yeah, the first term three for mechatronics will it start in fall 2023? Yes. Next, as an engineering one student currently in term two, I would love to apply for the mechatronics program. I personally have a background working in instrumentation and controls. I wouldn't have to wait until fall of 2023 to apply. If I were to go into electrical or computer engineering this fall, what would be the chances of the option to transfer into mechatronics down the road? Currently, we don't have options of switching among programs like that. So it's similar to, you know, if you start in a mechanical program asking if you could just switch over to electrical after a year, it's, 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 it's not really possible. We, we'd have to go back to term three because the courses in each of the programs are different. Which programming languages will be taught for the mechatronics engineering? <clears throat> Anyone on the panel there? What programming languages? Primarily MATLAB and Python would be the programming languages of uh, preference, but they would okay. be C++, which would be used uh, here and there. For okay. For embedded programming. Yeah. Okay. I'm currently in the last semester of the biology degree, which encompasses a lot of engineering one courses. I was wondering if only doing these four courses this coming fall and winter will negatively impact my competitiveness of getting into term three of the mechatronics program. Um, okay, so. You're only going to do the four engineering one courses. Um, I would like to say in general to students that have diff, um, detailed uh, curriculum related questions to reach out to our undergraduate studies office because um, you have unique situations, different courses that you've taken. It sounds to me looking at this that if you have those four courses, you would be able to um, apply to get into the the term three mechatronics, but we have the other courses in engineering one that you'd have to complete as well. 
getting to the end here. I know we're a bit past time. I hope you don't mind on the line. There's a lot of interested students and it's, it's great to see that. I'm curious as to what senior students miss out on with the delayed specialization into mechatronics compared to newer students who start working on this as early as term three. Um, well, I guess they would miss out on the, um, if you were in a mechanical program, you would miss out on some of the electrical courses that would be offered in mechatronics in the terms three and four and vice versa. If you were in electrical or computer engineering, you would miss out on some of those mechanical courses. So that would be a difference. And then last question, if a student were to return to term three for mechatronics, would they need to redo the common courses that have, they have already completed? My answer to that would be no, you, you've done those courses. I don't see a need why you'd need to do them again. Thank you, everyone. Those were excellent questions. Actually, more than I've ever seen in all the years that I've done these speaking of engineering lectures, just, and it goes to show we had a very, very productive evening, which brings me to the end. And before we finish, though, I'd like to thank several people. Again, our four presenters this evening, they are really uh, doing um, very extraordinary, interesting research and real you know, experts with specialized knowledge in this area that students would really enjoy very much if uh, you decide to go into mechatronics engineering. I'd like to thank Jackie Locke, who did a great job as always as communicate. She is the communications advisor in the faculty. She organized this event this evening. And last but not least, Paul Martin from CITL helped to keep this technical side of things in order. Thank you very much, Paul, Jackie, and, and our presenters for joining. And to you, all of the attendees, I hope you enjoyed this uh, present lecture this evening, or four rather. And that concludes. If you have any other questions, please, you know who our four experts on the line were. Please reach out to them. That's it, everyone. I wish you all a very good evening. Bye for now.